family and it's particularly special for our brother Mr. Wilkinson as he's going to be ordained tonight gospel ministry and installed as the minister in the congregation here in Londonderry. I want to extend a word of welcome to his parents, his mother and father who are here tonight. We do warmly welcome them in the Savior's name. Also a word of welcome to Mrs. Wilkinson and to her mother, brother and sister who are also joining us this evening. And I can't leave out a welcome to Emily and to Zach. A welcome to those who have come from Mr. Wilkinson's home congregation in Hockney And I know that there are others here tonight from various of our congregations across the province. We do welcome you warmly, the Savior's name. A word of welcome to all of the ministers and members of Presbytery who are here this evening. We welcome our moderator, the Reverend Armstrong, our deputy moderator, the Reverend Mercer, and our clerk of Presbytery, uh, the Reverend Greer. And uh, I mustn't forget to express a word of welcome to the congregation here in Londonderry, as it's a special night for Mr. Wilkinson. I know it's a very special night uh, for the congregation here. If you'll bear with me just for a few moments longer, I want to make just a few a few announcements to you. Uh, some additional planning was necessary uh, for the service tonight, as we have sought to observe the present guidelines relating to the virus. The seating arrangements are a little different from what is normal, and I have to express a word of thanks to Mr. John Murray uh, for the time that he has taken and the effort that he has put in to uh, do out a very detailed seating plan. I want to thank him for that and also to express thanks to the stewards this evening so that as you came you were able to get to your allotted uh, place. Can I say that uh, the congregation will remain seated whenever we are singing and then you will be asked to stand when prayer is being offered. The ordination itself, there will be just three taking part uh, directly. Uh, the moderator, uh, the clerk of presbytery and the clerk of session here in London Derry will participate in the laying on of hands and then after that only the clerk of session here will extend the right hand of fellowship uh, to Mr Wilkinson. No tea will be provided after the service tonight. Uh, it's usual of a service of this kind there would be refreshments served afterwards but because of the restrictions that we cannot do that, the congregation in London Derry here would love to have provided tea and refreshments for you, but that has not uh, been possible. And then can I say a word about the offering? Uh, there's no offering taken up during the service, but as you leave afterwards, you'll find baskets at the doors, and if you wish to give, uh, you will have an opportunity uh, so to do. Well, that's enough said uh, by way of welcome and announcement. And we're turning to your order of service uh, to sing the opening hymn, When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon radiant sun, when I stand with Christ on high, looking o'er life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe keeping your seats as you sing. And then after that, uh, the Reverend Timothy Omerod will come up to the lectern here to lead us to the throne of grace in prayer. Yeah. 
say it is an absolute joy to be here this evening and to be amongst even God's people this wonderful occasion for our brother Mr. Glenn Wilkinson. It is an honour as well to be asked to take part. I got to know Glenn over uh, the number of years in college together. He came in the year behind me and certainly from that time onwards it's been wonderful to see how the Lord has blessed him and how the Lord has used him thus far. And we're delighted that the Lord has called him to this place. And um, we do earnestly pray for him, for Debs, and for the children, that the Lord will bless them and be with them in the days ahead. I suppose I should call her Mrs. Wilkes and give her a proper title. But it is a joy to be here. And we're going to unite our hearts together in prayer. I ask you now to stand with me, please. And let's just look to the Lord for his blessing this evening. Let's pray.
our loving and our gracious God in heaven. We bow before thee this night in and through that precious and that wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, our blessed Redeemer, Jesus Christ. We thank thee, O God, this night for our standing in him. We rejoice, O God, this night that we are washed in his precious blood. We have been redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver or gold. But we thank and praise thee this night that we're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. We rejoice in that justification. We're justified by his blood. Thank thee for the adoption into the family of God. We rejoice this night that we can cry unto thee and we can call thee Abba, Father. And, o God, we come to thee with praise and with thanksgiving in our hearts. We rejoice, O God, in thy hand upon in this congregation in Londonderry, in thy hand upon our brother, uh, Mr. Wilkinson. And, o God, we do rejoice in the coming together of this man to this church. We do pray, O God, that thou wilt bless in the days of the Lord, even as this man of God is set apart even for this work here, that he will know the hand of God upon him. We pray, O Lord, that he will know the presence of God in the private place. He will know the power of God in the pulpit. He will know, O God, the prize of souls, even as he preaches forth the gospel, that he will see the prospering of the gospel message. He will see the lost souls of this area being brought in not only to the church, but brought into the family of God. O Father, we thank thee and we praise thee that we are living, O God, in days when thou art still moving. Lord, we do rejoice this day that we are coming even before a living God. We are coming before one who is all powerful. We thank thee for the power of that God. It's powerful enough to save us. It's powerful enough to keep us. And, oh, Father, as thy servant even comes and takes up this ministry, Lord, may he know even that power upon him. And may he rejoice at seeing the power of God in individuals like Lord, bless this congregation in the days that I had. We thank thee for thy hand upon it. Thank thee, O God, for the oversight and for each and every one associated with this congregation. Lord, we do pray that in the days that I had, that I will bless, O God, that I will use this church, that it will be a light in this darkened city, and it will even be that light to draw sinners on to thyself. Lord, remember this service tonight. We commit it into thy hands. We pray, O God, from start to finish, that it will be owned and blessed of thee, that I will have thine own way. O Lord, that I will bless each individual that has a part to play, whether it be in the reading of thy word, whether it be in the leading of this service. Lord, we pray for the time of the ordination as well. Lord, when the questions are put to our brother, he answers them before this congregation and before Almighty God. Lord, that I will burden them, and I will impress those issues upon his heart. Lord, we pray thee as well for the proclamation and the preaching of thy word. We pray for our moderator. Lord, we thank thee for him. We pray, O God, that thou wilt bless him. We pray, O God, that thou wilt give him that help from on high this night as he opens up and proclaims thy word. O Father, may it be that message for Glenn's heart. May it be that message for this congregation's heart. Lord, may it be even that starting point. Lord, that they can look back and see when the Lord dealt with hearts. The Lord even burdened the work here once again and pressed it upon each one. Lord, remember our brother and his wife. Lord, the children as well, we thank thee for them. And as they move to this area, O oh God, in the days that I had, may this area know that a man of God is amongst us. May this area know that there's a man of God, one who loves the Lord, one who loves his word. O oh Father, bless each one, we pray. Thee. Undertake this night, and above all, glorify thy Son. Oh, that he will be exalted far above all. We will not simply be here rejoicing in a man, but rather rejoicing in the God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless us, we pray. Undertake this now. In Jesus' name. Amen. I thank Mr. Amarad for leading us to the throne of grace in prayer. Now the Reverend Ray Kerskadden, Minister of our Karagari congregation is going to come and read the scriptures, and then immediately after that, uh, the Reverend Colin Mercer, our Deputy Moderator and Minister of our Oma congregation, will come and bring greetings from Presbyterian.
I'd ask you to turn with me this evening, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As you're turning God's word to that portion, I want to echo what uh, Brother Reverend Omerod has said. It is an honor, a privilege uh, to be here tonight. A greater honor and privilege to be able to take part also. Uh, I got to know Glenn again through uh, college. Join up with uh, with Glenn at Balagali and do the rest of the journey up to Belfast. We uh, we enjoyed our time together. Some good conversation, some good friendship was formed. And as I said in the past, in my own ordination, uh, I thank Glenn for the support he has been to me over the years. And I trust that even in some way I can be a support uh, to him in the days ahead. And on that note, I assure you of our prayers. I assure you of the prayers too of the folk in Kuragari. Uh, you're another part of your church family, as it were. And I know they'll be remembering you in prayer, and I know many of them are tuning in and listening tonight. So it is with delight that I'm here, and I do trust you and your family to God's richest blessings in the days ahead. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read uh, from verse 9 to the close of the chapter. Second Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 9. It says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance, and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we know uh, we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. In him. Amen. We do trust that God will bless the reading of his precious word to see. Let me ask you just to keep your Bible open and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5 for a moment. I want to read a couple of verses at the beginning of that chapter. Like the other brethren, it is a joy to be here tonight and to have a part in this very important service important time certainly for brother Glenn and his wife and a very important time for this congregation too. An ordination and installation service is a presbytery event and of course presbytery really is thrilled at the vacancy in this congregation being filled. We are delighted at the providence of God that brings Glenn and his family here to Londonderry and has given him this opportunity to minister in this great city. I've mentioned presbytery because this really is a presbytery event. And when a man applies to study under presbytery, he is interviewed by the presbytery. And presbytery undertakes to pray for him, takes an interest in his studies. He's interviewed as he comes in. He comes to presbytery every year in September time to have the exam remarks from college read out. He's also interviewed as he finishes his course and then, of course, he is licensed by presbytery as well. It's the presbytery who ratifies a congregational call. It's the presbytery who arranges 
service tonight and uh, makes the, the ordination and brings a man into the ministry under God. Ultimately, it is the Lord himself who oversees and superintends the appointment and the placement of his servants. The Lord Jesus Christ is the sole king and only head of his church. And as the exalted head, he oversees all the affairs of his people. The presbytery, therefore, tonight gives honor to Christ and thanks to Almighty God for bringing us to this point and bringing our brother Glenn to this point tonight, for calling him into the ministry, for saving him, first of all, calling him into the ministry, equipping him throughout his four years of college and extending the call to him to this congregation. Ministers serve as under shepherds. Christ is the great shepherd of his people. And therefore, Christ has the greatest interest in his people and in his servants as we minister for him. When I think of the service tonight and think of this congregation, my own home congregation, and therefore it has a very special place in my heart. And I know the congregation took me under their wing many, many years ago, and they will do the same for Glenn and his family, I have no doubt. And this city, needs a vibrant, faithful, powerful gospel witness. There's so much ecumenism, so much apostasy, so much spiritual declension all across the country, and this area is certainly no exception to that. And this church is a light in a dark place. And Glenn, it is our prayer as a presbytery, the Lord will bless you immensely as you take up the work here in London Derry. May he endue you with power from on give you a very strong bond of fellowship with the Lord's people here and fill you with a passion for the loss of this great city. I read, or I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 5. We do look to the Lord to bless you and Deborah and Emily and Zach. And I, I understand there's a lot of Ocknacloy people here tonight. And I know that your departure from them is a tremendous loss to that congregation. And they, and I, on their behalf, let me say that, that they will, uphold you in prayer, family, etc. Lord will be with you. And your mum and dad and Ruth and your brother too. The Lord understands very hard. First Peter five, Peter writes, the elders, verse one, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither has been lords over God's heritage, being in samples for the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory, it not. My mind was turned to that this afternoon. It talks about the minister and his congregation. They're described very simply as the flock of God. And the Lord's people are the Lord's people. We talk about our flock and our congregation, but they really are the Lord's. You have the minister and his conduct here. We are to feed the flock, and we are to do so willingly and be examples to them. But you have the comfort of the ministry, the chief shepherd, here. and our labor, because he died and lives and is coming again, our labor is not. Glenn, we do pray for you. Presbytery, look forward to hearing the Lord's blessing on you all in this city. May the Lord be with you. Days to come. Jesus. I'd like to thank Mr. Kerskadden for reading the scriptures to us, and also Mr. Mercer for bringing those greetings from Presbytery. We now come to the prescribed questions and subscription to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So I would ask the clerk of Presbytery, Mr. Greer, if he would come forward, and Mr. Wilkinson as well, please. Thank you, Aaron, for the words of welcome. And it is my privilege to be here tonight for this special meeting here in Londonderry. And I want to um, say to Wilkinson, invite your brother for you in days to come. In fact, our own congregation 
And I have been praying, rejoicing for the people who you have come to marry. I had the privilege of teaching Glenn for the past four years. Not just immediate four years, but four years this time in the college. I'm joy to do that. Very good student who certainly mentored himself to us as lecturers. Us will be with days to come. Questions I want to put to Mr. Wilkinson now have been brought up by Presbytery, and they are solemn questions. They reflect the stand and the position of our church, our beliefs, doctrines, and the distinctives of the Presbyterian Church. Therefore, while they are directed to Mr. Wilkinson, they are questions that the congregation also hear, and you will do that now as I read them. Servant. Have you the experience of the new birth and are you convinced of your call to the Christian ministry within the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster? Have. Um. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament not merely to contain but to be the verbally inspired word, the living God, the only infallible rule of faith? And practice. I do. Do you sincerely receive and believe the Westminster Standards and, Arc and the Articles of Faith of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scripture? I do. Will you subscribe the said confessions and articles as a confession of your own faith? Well, are you firmly resolved through divine grace? adhere to the doctrine contained in the said confessions and articles, and teach and defend it to the utmost of your power against all error. I am. Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in maintaining the truths of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in working for the purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise unto you on that account? Do. Will you maintain at all costs to personal reputation and vain worldly popularity the distinctives of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster and the three fundamentals of the faith set out by Dr. Henry Wood? Trinity, the vicarious atonement of Christ, the necessity of the work of the Spirit to originate faith and repentance in the heart of man. I will. You maintain with all the strength God shall give you the position on biblical separation from apostasy was taken by the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster in 1951 at the time of its secession from the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Well, as God helps you, will you, will you expose and resist the continued apostasy of Christ manifested within Irish Presbyterianism, Methodism, Episcopalianism, and other visible church bodies, exhorting God's people to obey the teaching and commandment, 1 Timothy 6, 3 to 5. I will. As God helps you, will you expose and resist the errors of Romanism and all other false religions and the errors of charismatism and all of its counterfeits of the genuine doctrine? Of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Well, as God helps you, will you give yourself to constant study of Scripture in order to edify the saints and win the lost to Christ in your ministry? Well, do you affirm and promise to proclaim the free offer of the gospel? Do. do you believe that it is only by the power of the infilling of the Holy Spirit? that you can make full proof of your ministry. I do. Do you believe the Presbyterian government and discipline, Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, we find it all agreeable to the Word of God? And do you promise to adhere to it and support it and to yield submission and be in subjection to your brethren as is taught in the Word of God? I do. Will you publicly expose and oppose the immorality 
and social vices of this present evil world, such as drinking, dancing, and gambling, and by example live righteously, soberly, and godly before all men. Will you maintain the purity of the communion of Christ, and by all scriptural and lawful means resist any attempt to weaken the testimony of the church and her stand born again communicant membership? You will. You engage to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all private and personal duties, become you as a Christian and minister of the gospel as well as in all relative duties and the public duties of your office, endeavouring to adorn the profession of the gospel by your conversation and walking with exemplary piety before the flock over which God shall make you overseer. Are you now willing to take charge of this congregation, promising to discharge the duties of the pastor to them as God Give you strength. I do. I am. And I invite the moderator to come and oversee the subscription and the ordination. Then Wilkinson, having answered by questions, will now sign the following. I believe the Westminster Confession and the Articles of Faith of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster be founded on and agreeable to the Word of God, and as such I subscribe them as the Confession of Brother, having received the call of God from this congregation, and that call having been sustained by a vote of the presbytery, now moved to his ordination and his installation. Since this is an ordination service, scriptural procedure dictates a laying on of hands. We're very aware also of the current regulations in relation to the COVID situation, and so, as was indicated earlier, Hands will be laid on by representatives of our president. And therefore, last but not least, to forward Mr. Doherty, also the part of the session here. Then. Could I ask the congregation please to stand? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, great head and sole king of the church, and by that authority which he hath given to the church for its edification, we do ordain you to the work of the gospel ministry and install you as the minister of this congregation. And for this purpose, may the blessing of God rest upon you, and the Spirit of God fill your heart. Bow in prayer. Eternal, everlasting, and our loving Father in heaven, we thank thee tonight that we are found in this ordination and installation service. We bless thee, O God, for the hand of God upon our brother, Mr. Wilkinson. We thank thee for the health and strength that thou hast given him. We thank thee, O God, for the abilities 
that thou hast bestowed upon him. We thank thee for the family into which he was born. The providence of God ensuring that he was raised within the sound of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for that time in his life's experience when free grace awoke him by light from on high. Then legal fears shook him. He trembled to die. No refuge, no safety in self could he see. Jehovah said, can you? His saviour must be. And we bless thee for that work of grace in our brother's heart. And for the wonderful time in his experience when Christ was made real to him and dear to him. When his sin was made an awful thing in his sight. And when he was called by God the Holy Ghost and redeemed by precious, precious blood. And what a time that was when the grace of God found him and the mercy of God reached down upon him and the salvation of God became his experience. And we rejoice, O oh God, in the wonderful change that salvation brings to the heart and life and individual. And Lord, we thank thee for calling. We thank thee, O oh God, for the work of grace that spoke to him in relation to full-time service. We thank thee for his time of study and training and preparation for the ministry of the gospel of Christ Jesus. We thank thee for how thou hast led him. And, O oh God, we thank thee that the hymn writer was able to say, Jesus led me all the way. And we thank thee that thou hast led him then to London Derry and to this congregation tonight. And we pray that thou wilt bless him from this moment in time. We ask that he'll feel the presence of God. He'll know the ministry and grace and power of God the Holy Ghost. We pray, O oh God, that thou wilt make him God's instrument and God's man in this congregation and area and district. And may it be noised abroad that the Lord has raised up in this congregation again, another gospel preacher, a man sent from God, a man with God's anointing. Grant then, O God, that his ministry here will be greatly blessed of God Almighty. And may the power of God be felt every time he mounts the pulpit step. So answer prayer. Unite the minister and congregation in love, in respect, in uh, great affection, the one for the other, overcoming day. And we pray that the good hand of the Lord will rest upon them and that the power of the Lord in this house continually will be present to heal. Remember his family. We commit them to God and to thy grace. We pray, O oh God, that quickly, as a family, they will be settled into the area. They'll find acceptance with their neighbors, with the people around, with those in the congregation. And we pray that God's hand will be upon them in days to come and the blessing of God be evident in their lives and ministry to the people here. Answer prayer and continue with us tonight in Jesus' name and for God's everlasting glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I feel that this is just an opportune moment uh, for me to uh, bring some apologies from those who have been unable to attend but would love to have been here. I received apology today from the Reverend Gordon Ferguson. Uh, he would have been delighted to have been in attendance, but that's not possible this evening. So he sends his greetings to you, Mr. Wilkinson, and he wants you to know that he was very pleased he was indeed delighted that you received the call to the London Dairy Congregation. He also wanted me to assure the congregation that you do have, in his words, an excellent minister. And he wants both minister and congregation to know that he will be remembering you much in prayer. And then another apology from a former minister, the Reverend Julian Patterson. I just read it to you. As a family, we were so pleased to hear of the Lord's leading for you to take up the work in Londonderry. 
We are sorry that due to the ongoing COVID situation, we are unable to join with you and the congregation in this new phase of Christ's service for you. Rest assured that we will continue to remember you, your family, and the good folk in Londonderry in prayer. And we trust that as a congregation together, you will see the kingdom of Christ continue to be extended in that part of his vineyard. In Christ, the Patterson family, and there's a verse of scripture at the end, John 10 and verse 4, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. Returning to your order of service once again uh, to sing the next hymn, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. And after we have sung this hymn, then our moderator, Reverend Armstrong, will come and bring the charge to the minister and congregation. singing. Great joy to be here tonight. Counted kind of a privilege and uh, a great honour to be able to come to share in this meeting, to see a congregation moving forward, uh, to be able to experience that personally, take part in the service is 
great, great joy indeed. I'd like to commence my remarks by firstly offering congratulations to the Reverend Wilkinson on his ordination to the Christian ministry tonight. It's one of the highlights of a man's life. That's what he trains for. That's what he makes his sacrifices for. He wonders at times in college and after college finishes as if a night like this will ever come and will ever arrive. And then when it comes, it's filled with excitement, maybe nervousness, anticipation, yet happiness, knowing that the invitation from a congregation to be their minister is in itself a confirmation of the call of God to full-time service. And so our brother has great cause to be happy this evening. And it's one of the high points in his life. And in life, there are some apex, some Everest moments, if you like. And this is one as far as our brother is concerned. I wish to commend him for reaching this point in his life and in his ministry. I'd like also to acclaim the congregation in ascertaining the Lord's will in this matter as well. And being subject to the Lord's leading. And we trust and pray that this union between minister and congregation will be a great blessing to both parties. And that many will bless the day when the Reverend Glenn will be called to this city and to this congregation. And so congratulations to all involved tonight. And I appreciate that the words of welcome. Trust indeed that we'll know the Lord's grace and presence. I'd like to turn you in the scripture to that passage that, that Mr. Kerskadden read to you a little earlier in the service. Particularly, draw your attention to one or two uh, words that are found, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now then, we are ambassadors. For Christ. Last to stand, please. We'll have a word of prayer just briefly. Eternal and our everlasting God and Father, we thank thee for the company of God's people. We thank thee that we're involved tonight in a great work, the work of God. We thank that we are bearing testimony tonight to the Lord's leading. The life of Mr. Wilkinson and the life of this congregation and this body of believers here in London Derry. And we bless thee, Lord, that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We can say that in relation to the congregation as well. And Lord, we rejoice tonight. We can therefore meet at this happy time around the word of God, and about the things of God. Turn our hearts, our minds, our thoughts for a little time tonight, just now, to the word of God. We pray, O oh God, for that closing out of every distracting thought, that closing in to God and to thy holy word and truth. Grant, Lord, that thou wilt solemnize our hearts, and as we sit under the ministry of the word of the living God, may there be a word to encourage, a word to bless, a word to help. No vain thing. Come before the open word of God. Give grace and help then in the ministry of the word tonight. Glorify thy name in our midst. In Jesus' holy and worthy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much indeed. It was the godly Robert Murray McShane of Dundee in Scotland who said, A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. In our day, if you say something is awful, well, you probably means you probably mean it was terrible or nasty. I have already had one man ask me not to be too long. Tonight, because he's hoping to go to McDonald's before it closes. If he goes to McDonald's and his chicken sandwich meal is, is awful, well, the chances are 
He'll never drive back to Londonderry from, I'll not tell you where he's driving from. Because awful means bad, generally speaking, to us. However, McShane, when he used the word awful, he was using it in the old sense of the word, which means something to be admired, something to wonder at. Literally, the word awful means something or someone that inspires awe. The word awe indicates respect or reverence or even amazement. And therefore, in the old-fashioned term of the word, the word awful means awe-inspiring. I want to speak to you tonight for a moment or two about an awe-inspiring minister. I wonder, are there many about? Certainly, every minister faithful to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, faithful to the book, and to the word of God ought to be all inspiring to the congregation, to the people to whom they're called. In this good sense of the word, an all inspiring minister. Firstly, a minister who inspires all is one who realizes that his office has been established by the Lord. Mr. Wilkinson, you have been called to an office. A wonderful office, a special office, the most blessed position ordained of God that any individual could possibly be called to. That office to which your call was executed in Old Testament times by the priest in Israel. Now, of course, the priest of Old Testament times had duties and responsibilities that were relevant to the times in which he lived alone. For example, the Old Testament priest offered sacrifices, a duty that has been done away with by the offering of Christ. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and the verse 12 that he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Hence the sacrificial aspect of the Old Testament priest's work has been done away with by the coming and by the death of Christ. It has been completely made redundant by the work of the Lord Jesus. But that sacrificial part of his work was only but a, a, a part of the work that the priest long ago had to perform because the priest in Old Testament times was also a pastor. He was God's man to the people. He provided spiritual guidance and counsel. He ministered to them on the Lord's behalf. The Old Testament priest was the Lord's representative among the people. The New Testament equivalent of that office carries with it the name of pastor or minister as we would commonly call them and therefore the new testament minister or the pastor must in a similar way see himself and conduct himself as god's representative among the people second corinthians chapter 5 and the verse 20 speaks primarily in regard to ministers and elders when it says to us who are involved in this great work, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador on the social level is a representative of his government in a foreign land. They take their advice and their lead from the government of the nation that they represent. And therefore, the minister of the gospel, when the apostle Paul under the superintendence of the Holy Ghost, here calls him an ambassador. The minister of the gospel is charged with representing Christ in this foreign land of earth. Because the word ambassador in scripture could be translated as representative. That's literally one of the meanings of the original word. The original language presents the word that's here translated as ambassador as presbo, 
which is taken from the word presbyterus, from which we get presbyter or elder. And therefore the minister, as is the case with the elder in the congregation, is a representative of the Lord, an ambassador of Christ among the people of the congregation and further afield. Brother, from now on, among this congregation, you are God's man. The Lord's representative in this congregation to which you have been called. This is a most solemn occasion indeed. Happy occasion, memorable occasion, most solemn occasion. Because this man tonight has been installed in this congregation to be God's man. That lays a responsibility. It lays a responsibility upon the members and friends, the congregation here in Londonderry, because as members and friends of this congregation, you must see him as such. God's man. God's ambassador. God's representative. And therefore, you should be in awe of him in this right sense. Firstly, because of the supremacy of the office to which he has been ordained tonight. Because being a minister of the gospel is the greatest calling that any man could ever experience. Because that individual has been called of God to serve the Lord in what is generally a full-time capacity. It was said many years ago that the sublimest or the most glorious calling which a man can attain on earth is that of preaching the word. The old Puritan Thomas Watson underlined the point also by saying the ministry is the most honorable employment in the world. Jesus Christ, he went on to say, has graced this calling by his entering into it. And therefore the minister is an individual with the highest of all calls. Having said that, it's right to make the point that the minister has a most onerous calling. Because our brother has now been called to be a governor, pastor, shepherd, teacher. An example, a man of prayer, above all, preacher of the word, and all that that is. So you are to be in all, then possible, because of the supremacy of him. You're to be in awe of him because of the service in the office. Because the minister of the gospel is called in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and the verse 23 to be abundant in labor. And there's one thing that our brother must not be, and I have no doubt in my mind that this will never be true of Glenn Wilkinson. He must never be lazy or careless in his work. Because he is the servant of Christ. And you will know that's what the word minister really indicates. He's called to serve Christ, not society. He's not called even to, in a sense, serve the saints or the sinners in this congregation. No, he's here to serve the Lord. Must be faithful to that calling. Matter what. Secondly, to be an awe-inspiring minister, our brother must be equipped for the work that the Lord has called him to. And then you've got to be qualified and equipped firstly as to your knowledge. Now I know that you have a basic knowledge of Hebrew and Greek. Maybe a bit more knowledge of Greek than of Hebrew. I, I don't know. Looking at the teacher. You need that basic knowledge. 
of those original languages. Because the Holy Scriptures, of course, were originally given in those languages. But above that, you must have a knowledge of the Scriptures themselves. Because the minister of the gospel, he's got to be a reader of the word. It's good to read other books. It's necessary to read other books. But brother, never allow the reading of other books, commentaries or whatever, to impinge upon your reading of the word of God. You've got to be able to search out the intent of the word and the context of the word. A minister has got to be able to compare scripture with scripture. But you know the most important of all, as far as an awe-inspiring minister and his knowledge is concerned, is this. He must have a knowledge of sins forgiven. He must be illuminated and convicted by God the Holy Ghost and be saved by the Lord's grace. That the truth which he reads in God's word is found in his own heart. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. You wonder how a man can preach or teach Christ and yet have no experience of Christ in his heart. Well, it happens. Every Sunday. Probably. Judas. Preached. Even though his heart was as dark as hell itself. For years prior to his conversion, John Wesley preached Christ. In early 1738, he led a prisoner to Christ. And after that man was converted to Christ, Wesley saw that he was instantly transformed. And he said to himself, this man has got something that I haven't. And that convicted him and it troubled him. And in the morning of the 24th of May, 1738, John Wesley opened his Bible and he read from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that they, by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Wesley realized that he was not in that sense a partaker of the divine nature. The Lord spoke to his heart and led him to faith in Christ, let me ask you tonight in this congregation, have you such a faith in Christ? Are you a child of God? Maybe you know the gospel so well that you could preach the gospel like Judas, like Wesley in his unconverted day. So it's, a, it's a, an amazing thing. Amazing. Man can stand on a pulpit and can preach and expound the word of God to the degree and yet know nothing. There will be those who will go from down that broad road and into hell because they've never been born of the Spirit of God. Make sure in this meeting, make sure you're a child of God. That's the most important. The primary thing. Proverbs 4 verse 7 says. With all thine understanding. Get Christ. With all thy getting. Get understanding. Get Christ. That's the most important thing. For a minister of the gospel. Is that he speaks from experience. That's the first priority. It's to his own soul. And thank God our brother is a testimony. To the Lord's grace. And the Lord's saving and keeping power, and you as a congregation, you want to thank God that you have a saved man in the pulpit, Lord's Day by Lord's Day. That's something that we in the free church, we take for granted at times. But then let me say to you again, that a minister must be equipped in the sense that he's able to teach. That's what Paul said of Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the verse 2, a bishop, a bishop is a, a minister or an elder, if you like. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, up to teach. Because not everyone, you know, who is 
the ability to be knowledgeable in the things of God has the ability to communicate that knowledge to others. Many a man can edify himself by the reading and the study of the word, but not everyone has the ability to edify others, teaching them in the things of God. An elder must have at least some sort of ability in that regard, but it is essential that a minister has such a talent to be able to teach, to be able to impart his spiritual wisdom in a manner that people find acceptable and pray that our brother will find acceptable. Teaching will be acceptable to you. And that you will grow in grace as a child of God under his teaching and under the blessing of God through the word that he will preach. A minister must have the ability of being grave. Writing to a young minister, Titus, the apostle Paul said in Titus 2 verse 7, And all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, Gravity, sincerity. The word gravity there really means good character. It doesn't mean you're not about with a, lo a long face every day, all day. No. The word gravity means that the, the minister of the gospel has got to show himself worthy of being well respected. Of course, it's right that people show respect to the office of the minister. Because that office has been instituted by the Lord and it is the office of the Lord's ambassador. But a minister as a person must earn the respect of his people. And he gains the respect of his people not with pretentiousness or to try and show his importance or by giving off an air of loftiness. No, a minister can't be arrogant. He can't be full of pride. He can't imagine himself to be someone or something rise above his station. Yes, he's called to a wonderful office, but the man himself has got to be an ordinary individual. Remember Moses, one of the greatest men ever to live in spiritual things, a giant in the things of God. You know what said of Moses in Numbers 12 and the verse 3? Now the man Moses was very meek. lowly man because he realized what the Lord had done and what the Lord did new ministers should be the most humble men in all the earth because they realize the pit from which the, the Lord has dug them they realize the job if I can call it a job that the Lord has given to them. And they realize that they have been blessed by given, being given authority to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The minister must have the ability to talk. Love the cause of Christ. He must love the people of Christ. He must love men and women in the world. That love must not be motivated by a mere desire for reciprocal love. That love must not be the result of some worldly ambition. That love must solely consist in the desire for the spiritual welfare. Minister, God, they have a plan. Shepherd's concern, brother said, for those under his charge. Paul said of the people of Philippi, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7, I have you there. Brother, that's where the people from there got to be. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and the verse 14 here. The apostle says that the, the love of Christ constrains him. I have a question for you. Is Paul speaking there of Christ's love for him? 
or his love for Christ, in a sense, it doesn't really matter. Whichever view you take, that love constrained him. The word is it held him fast. And the thought behind the word constrained is as a lawman would hold on to his prisoner, trying to get away. I heard talk last night was on TV about police in the mainland using tasers. But if there were no tasers and someone arrested a prisoner, how would he ensure that he wouldn't escape from him? He would do so by holding on to him, by clinging on to him with all of his might. That's the, the word, the love of Christ. Strain the Apostle Paul. It made him, if you like, cling on to the work of difficult times. It made him go again to the pulpit whenever things were hard. It made him preach the gospel to his people. It was the, the love of Christ, the love for Christ, the evidence of the love of Christ in his heart. Then, following on from that, the office of the minister calls for an ability of self-denial. People, yes, I know family must occupy a prominent place, but I'm talking about the church. People come first because it is the well-being of the people, the flock, the congregation that's paramount. And so if he hears of a need, he goes. Doesn't matter how inconvenient it is for him, he goes. Weeps with the weeping. Laughs with the joyful. He's a strength to the weak. He's an encourager of the downcast. The warning. Love, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 and 5 seeketh not her own or is not selfish. Love puts congregation first. Once more, the office of the minister requires the ability of diligence. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 3 and the verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. And so the ministry is a work. A lazy man isn't fit to be a, a spiritual shepherd. The Bible speaks about the slugger. So the minister, he visits the healthy as well as the sick member. He takes whatever action in normal times the situation demands. He works in preparation. He works in the study. He has weddings, he has funerals, he has session and committee meetings, he has 101 other things to do. And all of these things require time, and time is short, and so the minister's got to be vigilant. Allowing no time to pass by idly. An old commentator writing on these things said, if someone has come into the ministry for monetary reasons, or to lead a nice, soft, and easy life, he ought to return from where he came. For this office requires work. It requires work. The Lord. But to God in all these matters that I've mentioned to you. Thirdly, finally, let me speak to you about the exercise of this office. What is the minister's primary work? Well, uh, there's three points I might make to you. Firstly, the minister's got to have prayer. Because above all, he's got to be a man of prayer. And the minister must pray more than what I might call the ordinary Christian because the minister has burdens, concerns, and worries, and trials and the lights that ordinary Christians know nothing about. Don't mind me. He must pray more than the ordinary Christian because in the general course of things, he must go about his ministerial duties no matter what's happening at home. So he will leave sick children, sick wife, go to the pub. 
wakes up on the Lord's Day morning and he doesn't feel like going to church. We're all only human. He goes. Because that's why he's called. What he's called to. He must pray more than the ordinary Christian because the eye of so many is upon him. One serious slip and his ministry can end in shipwreck like a sinking ship and he often takes her down. He must pray because if he doesn't have a quality prayer life, his ministry just shrivels. Great pianist said many years ago, if I miss practice for one day, I know it. If I miss practice for two days, the family knows it. If I miss practice for three days, everybody knows it. Prayer for the minister is the most vital of all. The minister must be faithful in the private place of prayer. Pray without ceasing is the injunction of Scripture. You might ask, well, how do I know if my minister prays in the private place or not? You'll know by his preaching. You'll know by how he conducts himself. You'll know by what he says. You'll know by how he deals with people. You'll know when he prays publicly. Remember how Christ went to pray alone? If the great minister and shepherd of our souls, who was often found alone of his father, felt the need to go and pray, how much more those of us who seek to follow him and preach his word, the congregation won't have any trouble. Turn it round. Won't have any trouble. Praying. Minister must. Because when he comes to this pulpit, he's got to be able to lead the people in the worship of prayer. And such a prayer sets a tone for the meeting. If the prayer is dry and staid, so will the preaching be. So will the singing be. So will the meeting be. In public prayer, he'll follow the pattern that Paul gave to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we read there, of course, how the Apostle Paul declared that supplications, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks would be made for all men. Man in the pulpit, he's got to pray for all men in the congregation. Those whom he likes, those who go on with him, those who don't. He prays for every class and condition of men. And so the man in the pulpit in his public prayer, he prays for those in the congregation. He prays for men in general. He prays according to verse 2 of 1 Timothy 2 for those in authority as well. He prays in different manners also. Because verse 1 of 1 Timothy 2 speaks about supplication. That's for the averting of evil. The Bible speaks there also about the minister praying prayers. That's for everyday wishes and desires. The, the Bible speaks about intercession. He prays for others. The Bible speaks also about praying, giving of thanks for the mercies received, temporal and spirit. Man in the pulpit, the minister, if he's going to be in awe of his congregation, he must be prudent in the public place of prayer as well. Because he's asked to pray in all kinds of situations. Happy times, sad times, unexpected. Got to go to the pulpit. So he needs to be able to sum up the situation, be sensitive to the needs of those around him and the circumstances in which he finds himself. He must pray with and for the people without bias, without prejudice. Causes public prayers. When he leads in the congregational prayer during the service, as someone has said, he functions as the mouth of the congregation toward God. Helmus Abrakel wrote on the minister's public prayer, and he made one or two points. I want to mention to you just very briefly. Because he said, whenever the minister goes to public prayer, he ought to reflect beforehand on what he's going to do. He should spend time in preparation for prayer. 
as he does preach. In public prayer, he should have respect and reverence, a Brackle said, for the one to whom he is praying. He should pray in an orderly and thoughtful manner, not jumping from one matter to the next and back again, but in a regulated manner. He ought to keep away from referring too much to his own bodily weakness. If he doesn't feel well, if he has some sort of infirmity, and this is what Abrekel said, he, he maintained that such praying gives too much, and I'm quoting him, too much an impression of soliciting pity from people or providing an excuse if he doesn't preach very well. We've all tried that one. Providing an excuse. Lord, I'm not feeling well this morning. Providing an excuse for not preaching very well or because he didn't study enough. Or to solicit adoration or well-doing in spite of being weak in body. Brethren, those of us who are in the ministry, so much that we can do. So much that God, the Lord, would bring. Even in relation to the public. Seeking the Lord. The second task of the minister. The ambassador, to think again of our text, the ambassador is a proclaimer of the government's policy. And so, the gospel minister, he is charged with proclaiming the word of God. He doesn't have fresh revelations of what God has to say to man. No, that's something the apostles had to a degree. They were revealers of the gospel in the early New Testament age. Preachers today, we are not revealers in the sense that we preach a new message. No, we preach the same old truths. And so your new minister's responsibility is not to bring you some new word, some new message. No, it's to faithfully preach the old message. With the power of God, the Holy Ghost, the preacher, the best preacher, someone has said, is not one that tickles the ear, but breaks the heart. Brother, into the heart. Into the heart. Don't preach to impress. Preach. And in preaching, the minister's got to remind himself that the Lord has sent. He doesn't come to the pulpit on his own air. He ascends the pulpit as God's ambassador. He speaks in the name of the Almighty. And is the mouth of the Almighty to the congregation. So he stands before his people, not in awe of the nation, but in awe of the Lord. His concern is not what the congregation will think of him, his concern. To apply the word. To by God's help see sinners converted. To comfort. To stir up the people of God. To encourage them. To see them growing. Free. And he preaches. Believing that all things. By way of accomplishment are of God. But he preaches as though everything. So he preaches. He preaches to be successful, not to be successful. The other public task is that the pastor. This I'm concluded. Proverbs 27 and the verse 23 says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flock. Because a minister has reason to deal with everyone according to each person's circumstances. He knows his people. Not from a nosiness point of view, but from the spiritual aspect. He knows those who are unconverted. He knows those who are going on with the Lord. 
He must get to know those who aren't perhaps growing spiritually as much as they should. The people and their soul state are his business. Him with every fiber of your being. Pray for him. Pray for him. Yeah. Encourage him. Do all you can help. May you say, in the words of McShea, no. Inspiring minister. Man that you can look up to. A man that you can respect. A man that you can love. A man that you can go to in confidence. A man whom you know has the very best for you in his heart. And I trust, I'm sure, Mr. Wilkinson will be that man in this congregation. May the Lord bless his word to our heart. Now just briefly in a word of prayer. Eternal God and Father, we pray for what has been of thyself in the word tonight. We ask, O God, that thou wilt write the truths of thy word upon our heart. And may we know much of the power of God Bless every minister here. Lord, we need thee. We're only poor, weak human beings. We need the Lord's help and the Lord's grace. Lord, send us a revival to our pulpit, to our own heart, to our presbytery, to our congregation. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to thank the moderator for that solemn word. It certainly was a challenge to my heart. We do pray the Lord will bless it to, to all our hearts, even this evening, and to apply it to our hearts. I just want to give a brief word of testimony. At this stage, it will be brief. I plan to give a word of testimony on the Lord's Day evening to the congregation here. But I want to start by thanking Almighty God and praising Him, for He's the reason I have a testimony to give tonight. It is due to the mercy and grace of God, the one who loved me before I loved Him, that I can stand here tonight and speak of His amazing grace. My testimony simply is that this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. As a boy of 10, I realized I was poor, poor spiritually speaking, because I realized I was a sinner and that I was unable to save myself or do anything to earn salvation or God's heaven. But I thank God for the, the cross of Christ, the Lord there bled and died and suffered in my stead. And I thank him that he saved me. I turned from my sins, a boy of ten, and trusted in Christ as my saviour. And I thank the Lord for his hand upon me. And even in later years when I backslid and got away from the Lord, I thank you that he drew me back to himself again, restored unto me the joy of his salvation. So I stand before you tonight, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, I'm thankful for every mercy I've received from his bountiful hand. I want to move from my spiritual birth to my physical birth. And just want to give thanks tonight to my parents for all they have done for us. The Lord has given me wonderful parents. I have to say that tonight without doubt. They're the most gracious, generous and godly parents that anyone could hope to have. And I do thank the Lord for them. They've been such an example to me and to my family, and they've shown us love beyond measure, have given sacrificially, to help us through college, and even to this very day. 
And I do thank the Lord for them and I love them with all my heart. And do please pray for them uh, as we would even leave home. Uh, we've been together. I'm an only child. So we've been together for 46 years. So it's a big, a big change for them also. So do pray for them as well as we move on in this stage in our life. I want to say a few words of thanks also to Deborah and to the children as well at this stage. Uh, when she married me, I'm sure she never imagined for a moment that one day the Lord would lead us in this direction and into the ministry. But I thank the Lord for her and for giving me such a loving, attentive and supportive wife. One who has been a rock to me even through college and has always been an encouragement to me even in these, those most difficult times. You know, often people focus upon the man and they often forget about the wife, but it hasn't been easy for her. And I suppose in one sense, it's only really getting started. Uh, she leaves a home of 20 years. We'll be married 20 years now in August. So we'll leave a home of 20 years. We'll leave family. Uh, she leaves a jo her job and moves here to settle into a new area. But thank the Lord, she's, she's never complained and she knows it's the Lord's will for our lives. And do please pray for her as she sets up a new home and makes new friends. And pray for Emily and Zach also. Um, I'm probably, I know I'm biased, but I couldn't have asked for, for better children. And they're both so thoughtful, so kind. And I know the move will be difficult, difficult for them also, but do pray for them as they embrace this new challenge even in their lives. And I want to say to them all, I love you all very much and I thank the Lord for you every day. A thanks also to Deborah's mum for all her love and support and care. And also to Deborah's sister Ruth and to Charlie and Ethan and to Deborah's brother Jonathan, wife Jane and Holly and Noah and Bobby. We thank you all for all you've done for us and how you have helped us even over this past few years. I want to thank each and every one for coming tonight. It's lovely to see you all. And it's a great joy for us to have you here and to share in this special occasion with us. And many have made great efforts to be here. I've come even long distances from, from County Monaghan. And I know many of you have a long distance tonight. Travel on to different places tomorrow. We do thank you for coming. And we're sorry that we can't offer you a cup of tea, but our brother was speaking about McDonald's. Well, I checked. It's open to one o'clock tonight. So these are all... All, you can race down and see who gets there first um, through the drive through but there'll be something there for you. But we're sorry we couldn't um, have that time of fellowship that we would long to have. And others as well we'd love to have here tonight, friends and family and people who've been very close to us. But obviously because of the restrictions, we were unable to do that. But we do thank those who are tuning in online. We know there are many family members and friends who are tuning in. And I want to thank them for that as well and for all their prayers and support. Uh, can I thank also those who have taken part tonight? I thank Reverend Mercer as well for his kind words and his kind words even on Sunday past in, in Ochnacloy. I do thank him for his fellowship. We've got to know him over this past three years or so and uh, become a good friend. And we do thank you for coming tonight and taking part. Also, there are folk in our own church in Ochnacloy. Thank you all for coming tonight and we thank you for your prayers and support and uh, fellowship even over this past 15 years that we've been together in that congregation. I do thank also um, Reverend Gray as well, and we thank him and even the session in Tandra Gee for the opportunity to serve there for this past 15 months. Uh, but due to obviously the restrictions with COVID, that was kind of curtailed a little bit. We do thank for the opportunity. We learned much from him, and we thank the congregation there for all their help and love and support. I want to thank also Reverend Omerod and Reverend Skadden for taking part tonight also. We've become good friends. We met through college and uh, I said earlier that I'm, I'm an only child, so I have no brothers. So they've become like younger brothers to me in a sense. And uh, maybe I shouldn't say younger brothers because I've heard in recent days and in days past that both from both their congregations that the members of their congregation think that these two men um, are older than me. When in fact I'm 11 years older than one and 10, year, 10 years older than the other. Um, so I don't know if that's what the ministry does to you, brethren. It makes you older than you look. But I do thank you for your fellowship and your kind words tonight. And even your wives as well, who become good friends to us all as a family. 
and your children. We thank you that you take part tonight. I want to thank also Reverend Ian and the Cross Gar Session and Congregation for the time I was able to serve there during my last year of Bible College. Again, I learned much from um, our brother. He was my minister in Corrigari for many years. He also married us almost 20 years ago as well. So it's nice to have him and his wife with us tonight. We thank you for coming. I want to thank also Reverend Ferguson. I'm sorry he's not able to be here tonight. We'd love to have had him. He's been a great encouragement to me. Even since I started college, he's always been praying for me and there to encourage me. And I do thank our brother and also all the Whitfield lecturers and all the men who've helped in, in the college and in the training. And also to some of my fellow students who are here tonight. I thank Reverend Moffat and Reverend McVeigh for being able to attend tonight. We had a good time in college together. We had a good time of fellowship and there were tough times as well. Uh, but we got through it and we've come out the other end. And I do thank you for your friendship, brethren, and the other uh, students who are in our class also. I do thank them all for their friendship. And also to um, our brother Erskadden mentioned about traveling together. Thank you, our brother Raymond Morrow and Simon Anderson. We traveled up and down to college many days and uh, many afternoons on the way home, especially after theology class, Mr. Greer. We had many discussions on the way up the road uh, about what was discussed and what was right and what was wrong and what we understood and what we didn't. And normally by the time we got to Ballygolly Roundabout, we had it all sorted out. And we are known as the, the theologians from the West among ourselves. But we do thank them for their friendship as well uh, these past few years. Let me also thank Reverend Abraham. It's good to have him with us tonight also. I do thank our brother for the many opportunities he gave me to preach. My first time I ever preached, he gave me the opportunity to preach. And I thank him for all the times he was there to encourage me and to help me even to this stage we're at tonight. Let me thank Reverend Curran also and all the men here in Londonderry for all their help tonight and in making this night possible and bringing all these things together. Last but not least, I want to thank the, the congregation here in Londonderry for calling me to this congregation, for putting their, their trust in me. I'm humbled to receive a call. As our brother Armstrong mentioned, you know, you come out of college and yes, you train for, for this night, but you never think it's going to happen, especially this past year, year and a half of lockdown and all the things that has happened. Uh, things have kind of taken a back seat in that regard of calls and things like that. And But I thank the Lord that you have um, given me this call and we pray the Lord to bless us even in the incoming days. I step out in faith in the Lord's service. I know that I dare not trust my own abilities. Because if I trust my own abilities, I'm only wasting my time and your time. But I'm trusting in the Lord, the one who has called me and the one who has equipped me. And I would ask you to pray that he would make me a spirit-filled preacher. That I would know that holy unction in my ministry. And above all else, that I would preach Christ. Christ in all his fullness. I do thank you for your attention. Again, I thank you for coming tonight and being part of this meeting. And I do really appreciate it. We'll sing a, a final hymn now. I have only one life on this earth. And as vapor is passing away, I must labor for treasures of worth. Their toil ends at the close of the day. These hymns I've chosen tonight, especially the, the last hymn, When I Survey the Wonders Cross, and this hymn, uh, the Lord was used these hymns that were instrumental in regards to my call even to college, for so they're very precious, even to me tonight. At the end of this hymn, I ask Reverend Gray to come forward, please, and to close in a word of prayer.
Thank you for standing. I, on behalf of our congregation in Tandragee, wish Brother Glenn, his dear wife, and family God's richest blessing in the days that lie ahead and assure them of our prayers in the days that lie ahead. Let's all pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee and we praise thee for thy presence with us tonight. We thank thee, Lord, for thy precious word to our hearts. And, O oh God, we do pray that as my brother, Mr. Wilkinson, takes up the ministry here in London Dairy, that you would bless him richly, that you would indeed fill him afresh with the Spirit of God. And, O oh God, that he might see many precious souls, one for his labor. Bless his dear wife and his family. We commit and commend them lovingly into your care. And we pray, O oh God, that the congregation here in the days that lie ahead will know the blessing of God. O oh God, we just thank thee and praise thee for the privilege of serving thee. And O oh God, we recognize tonight that, Lord, we need thee more today than we ever have needed thee before. And we pray, Lord, for a breath from heaven. We ask the Lord that you would defeat the devil, that you would bind the strong man in Jesus' name. And in these days, Lord, that you would come again into your church. And, O oh God, we'll be very careful to give to thee the praise, the glory, and every bit of the honor. We thank thee for thy servant tonight especially. We thank thee for the day you saved him, redeemed him by your precious blood. We thank thee for the day you called him. And, O oh God, we thank thee for the gifts that you have given to him. And we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased, Lord, from this day forth to anoint him with thy power. So bless us now, Lord. We do pray that you'll bless the rest of this meeting. And then, Lord, when the meeting is over, bring us all to our homes in safety. Give us journeying mercies. For us in Jesus' precious name we ask. It. Amen. Mr. John Murray from the congregation is going to come and make some comments. Now, before he does, just let me give the, some instructions in regards to you exiting the building. Obviously, with you to the situation of the COVID and all the rest. We don't want all, everyone heading out the one door, but if this side of the ground floor can exit by this door here, out into the car park, and this side, out this door, and then those in the gallery, out through the front door that you come in, that would be much appreciated. And the stewards will show you out anyway if you leave the building. But Mr. Murray is going to come and say a few words. I would like to give you all a warm word of welcome tonight. It's nice to see the number that's gathered up. And I know you've been welcomed a number of times, and I feel like I'm repeating over again what has already been said. But I would like to welcome you and everyone. Some have traveled quite a distance here tonight. There's those that come from as far south as Ochnacloy, as far east as Crossgar and Ballygown, and many in between not forgetting County Monaghan and those that have come there. How could we forget about County Monaghan? And we bid you all very, very welcome here tonight, and we hope that you had a blessed time as we gathered around the Word of God and had the ordination of the here tonight. Uh, we do welcome you in the Saviour's name, and of course we also welcome those that are watching online, uh, and we appreciate even them logging in. And we pray that the Lord will even have blessed them and their soul as well. I'd like also to thank all those that have taken part in the service tonight uh, and for the, what they have contributed towards making this a memorable night here in Londonderry. And uh, especially to our moderator, appreciate him coming. I know he, he has a busy schedule and it's nice to have him with us and to bring the word of God to us. And it certainly was a challenge to my heart as I sat under the sound of his preaching here tonight. Also, a very special word of thanks to our brother Stephen Hogg. Stephen has made it possible that this has gone online here tonight. Uh, he was down here a fortnight ago doing test runs, making sure that it worked. And then we were here last night to 11 o'clock 
uh, and he's back here again tonight. And we do appreciate all that you've done for us, Stephen. Thank you for that, and you made it possible that we were able to go on and here tonight. It is my privilege on behalf of the session, the committee, and the congregation uh, that to here to be able to welcome uh, our brother to the ministry here and to his wife and family uh, into our midst. Uh, we pray that the Lord will bless them as he takes up the work here in our midst. And our prayer is that God will help them settle in with, with us here and settle in among the people and feel at home amongst us. You know, when we met on the 25th of May, God's hand of guidance on this congregation, and he, he guided the congregation to issue the call for a brother. And you know, many of the students, when they, they finish college, uh, they're looking for a call, and most of them will get a call within a few months, but a brother didn't, and he had to wait. But you know, bro brother, the reason was the Lord knew for us here in Londonderry, but Londonderry wasn't you to come. That's why you had to wait. And uh, we appreciate it that the Lord did keep you waiting, and we are feel it privileged that we have uh, you with us here. Uh, it was a blessing and a thrill to our soul on the night of Presbytery whenever you gave your answer to the coming, and we've been looking forward to this night ever since. And we pray that the Lord will bless you, brother, as you take up the reins of the ministry here in this congregation. Our prayer is that you will know the rich blessing of God upon your soul and that the Lord will use you in our midst and that you will, he will give you many souls for your hire as you labor amongst here in Londonderry. We look forward to your ministry, uh, that God would challenge us through preaching of the word, that God would build us up in our faith, that we bring us closer to him and we would have a closer walk with God. And so, brother, I'm going to ask you if you will in here to make a little presentation, a few presentations to make here. And as I will ask you if you could join us here. Brother, on behalf of the session committee and congregation of Mary, we'd like to give you this token commemorating the occasion here. I'm going to ask Mrs. Wilkerson to come front here and Mrs. Ritchie to come forward. She's going to make a presentation to you. You're not going to give us a speech, sister. <laughs> <laughs> you know, during the vacancy here, we were very blessed to have as an, our, our interim moderator, the Reverend Leslie Kern. We enjoyed his ministry as he fed us upon the finest of week, God's word. Uh, and week by week, as he came along to our midweek meetings, uh, we look forward to them. I personally can testify of God's blessing through your ministry here. Uh, I was richly blessed and, and enjoyed it, and I know others have as well. They have testified of your uh, blessing through your ministry. And we appreciated all your wisdom and your guidance throughout the vacancy. And you're laboring to bring us to this point here tonight. Uh, and so I would like you to come forward to make a presentation to you on behalf of the congregation here. God bless you. No, you, you haven't got with us. Senior minister here, you're still with us. We won't see as much of you. We have been. We appreciate all the Yes. 
That's all I have to say, and I'm going to hand back. I do thank Mr. Murray for those very generous gifts and kind words of welcome, and we do appreciate them very much. We're looking forward to getting started in the work here with folk in Londonderry, getting to know you all, and we pray that the Lord will bless us abundantly in the incoming days and weeks and months and years lie ahead for his blessing on us all. Sorry there's no supper. I can't say anything but supper, but as I said, McDonald's is open to one o'clock. Present link. It's only up at a few hundred yards up the road there. You, you can't miss it. But we do appreciate you all coming, really do. It means a lot to us to see you all here tonight. We pray the Lord will bless each and every one of you.